Hello and welcome. This is Lisa Jones, and you are listening to the Exploring Death Podcast. Welcome to the Exploring Death Podcast. I'm Lisa Jones, your host, and today I have Dr. Raymond Moody with me. Dr. Raymond Moody is a world-renowned scholar, lecturer, and researcher, and he is widely recognized as the leading authority on near-death experiences. He is a best-selling author of 12 books, including Life After Life, Glimpses of Eternity, and Reunions, which have sold millions of copies worldwide. Dr. Moody offers a variety of lectures, workshops, and presentations on topics including near-death experiences, death with dignity, visionary encounters with departed loved ones, the healing power of humor, and the loss of children. He's also a featured expert in the media and has appeared on hundreds of local and nationally syndicated programs, such as the NBC Today Show, ABC's Turning Point, Oprah, Coast to Coast AM, as well as other popular talk shows on television and radio. And today, he's here with me on Exploring Death. Welcome, Dr. Moody. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me on today. Thank you. Oh, well, you're so welcome. And I was just saying that as I was reading through your bio, I truly believe you are my quintessential hero in this whole topic of death. I'm, I've, I lost my husband 15 years ago and had an out-of-body experience and saw him actually being welcomed into heaven. And it completely shifted my entire experience here on this earth before that i was i was very much a believer that um you know in the in the christian philosophy that if you weren't baptized you were going to hell so i I truly thought my husband was going to go to hell because he didn't want to be baptized and um and then i had this experience and it just it it thankfully shattered all of my beliefs and (laughs) and now i've had just the most amazing experiences of connecting with spirit and and having other um, you know, paranormal situations. And, and so here you are, the, the founder and the leader of this whole thing. Well, I, I don't really think of it that way, Lisa. I got this from Plato is where I got it. And uh, as an undergraduate philosophy student at the University of Virginia, I, I had not been raised religious. Uh, and just to be quite frank about it, when I went off to college, I thought religious people were just kind of deluded and, um, you know, silly and wishful thinking and all. But, um, and I had never really had any idea that anybody took the notion of an afterlife seriously. But I read in Plato's Republic um, and then was told by my professor that these early Greek philosophers studied cases of people who were believed dead and revived and who told these experiences of going to another world. So, but still just thinking it was a, an ancient Greek thing, but in three years later in 1965, I met uh, Dr. George Ritchie, who at that time was a professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. And he had had such an experience. And so he was the first living person I heard. Now I've heard it from literally thousands of people and uh like you i've sort of i never really um thought there was anything to it i i knew obviously from the very beginning that the people who described these experiences were being sincere and pretty quickly i knew it wasn't the oxygen deprivation to the brain because uh After I got my PhD in philosophy, I was a philosophy professor for three years. For three years, then I went to medical school, and um, one of the first few months of medical school, one of my own uh, medical school professors told me about similarly to what happened to you. She was uh, forced to resuscitate her own mother. Think of that, you know, what a horrifying experience, but. During that time, she left her own body and she saw her mother die and she saw her mother there in spirit form with her and saw her mother drifting off into this light and being greeted by obviously people who had passed on before. So um, just gradually, I've gotten to the point where I give up. I mean, I just don't know what else to say, but then it's 
to my utter astonishment, there is an afterlife. Yeah. Wow. I, and I know because I, you know, I still know people that, that think it's about the brain deprivation or, you know, the oxygen deprivation. And, and I guess, I don't know. I, I, it's like you said, it's almost, you've taken that leap of faith and just, you, you just, you can't go anywhere else, but there, but what about the people that are still locked in and just don't want to give up that belief system that somehow our brains that we don't know enough about them and that that's, what's creating this experience for us. Well, I'm just so happy I got a PhD in philosophy before I went to medical school because, I mean, it's possible, I guess, for somebody to be taken up into that point of view called epiphenomenalism, which is the, the, uh, that there is no independent reality to consciousness, but that what we call consciousness is a uh, secondary byproduct of the electrochemical reactions in the brain. But um, you know, that doesn't even work for people who, all, who get resuscitated after a cardiac arrest. Much less does it work uh, for people who are there at the bedside of somebody else who is dying. And as the person in the bed passes away, the bystanders have these experiences. Well, that's not oxygen deprivation to the brain. They're not ill or injured. So what is it? What is that? That is true. That is true. Yeah, my experience, I, I did not have lack of oxygen. I was just asleep in the other room. And, and it just so happened it coincided precisely at the moment that my Mm -hmm. husband took his last breath and in fact as i was in my quote unquote heaven ex you know f experience as, as all these souls were just about to welcome him in a giant door started to open and everybody started cheering and right at that moment my brother-in-law knocked on my door and said lisa oh my god wake up you're you know ian's just taken his last breath and so I didn't actually see him come in because I don't know, I almost think I would have stayed had I seen him up there, you know, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, it was just the, the coincidence of that all timing wise happening and unfolding at the precise moment also seems rather. Um, well, it's, it's just so common. It's, uh, you know, these things sound unusual to talk about, but if you open the subject up in a group of a hundred people, you're going to find plenty of people there who've been through this. This is a common human experience. Yes, yes, amazing. And, and it's so interesting to me, too, just the way your path continues. I mean, for example, you went to college just thinking, you know, oh, religious people are kind of delusional or whatever. And, and yet, um, you know, just whatever unfolded for you in your life and running across the Plato uh, readings and then your professor and I just love kind of I always like to call them breadcrumbs that just keep you kind of on the path to discover the next amazing experience and that's kind of what happened I just recently moved to Maui and I got in um, asked to speak at the IANS group here which is the International Association of Near-Death Studies and I had never heard of that organization before and yet all of a sudden that was just a bright new bulb for me because now I'm surrounded by here, many, many people here on Maui that have experienced that as well as attending the conference and meeting and interviewing, um, you know, several of people. In fact, Jeff uh, Olson and, and Jeff O'Driscoll, who wow. you're going to be talking with later today, yes. I've interviewed them. So it's just such a beautiful. <laughs> That's wow. just an absolutely beyond amazing series <laughs> of events that happened to those two. Oh, I know. It's amazing. And, and for my listeners, if you want to hear about them, I've, I've interviewed both of them and you can, you can check back on the podcast to hear their stories because it's a phenomenal experience or, or a story of, um, of one of them having a car accident and then the other, the doctor, seeing his wife who had passed away in the, oh, or, you know, in the emergency room. So it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for, let me ask you, have you had any specific, you know, either near death or out of body or, you know, experiences? You know, I have had, I've never had a full blown near death experience. I, um, I have had a couple of really uh, startling apparitional occurrences in my life that, um, that, I mean, I, what else can you say except I, not very long ago, I talked to a 
friend of mine who died in 1996 and I, I talked to her just recently. I mean, I, how does this work? Um, you know, you get to a certain point where um, it's, I, I, you see, one of my areas in philosophy is logic and uh, philosophy of language. And I still am a logician at heart. I, um, I think it's important for, real, to real, for people to realize that um, really there just isn't any way that logic can draw the conclusion that there's life after death. And um, so that's all right. It's, it's not the modality to do it. However, there are other ways to reach that kind of um, awareness or insight that I now have. But, but I think that's going to be quickly corrected because um, all the logical problems that we used to have are now nil because now we have ways of thinking about this that do make sense. Um, and it has to Can we hold on one second? There's just so much background noise. Every time she's, uh, it's picking up everything I think that she's doing. Oh, oh, oh sorry. It That's was, okay. But. Um, hold on one second. Let's be, let's just hold for five seconds and then we'll, we'll pick it up. Right. Okay. But, um, I, the, the difficulty for people who think okay, on this question is, and it is an accurate difficulty, this, this really is a difficulty, is that the logic that we use in everyday life and thinking about daily problems, but also about the big problems of science and, and so on, that that logic is not geared to think about sentences like there is life after death because when you say there is life after death that's a self-contradiction right if you think about it because what it translates out to is there is life after the irreversible cessation of life which is a self-contradiction so the talk about life after death death doesn't fit into the rational system that we have but that's all right, because what I have actually been lurk, working on since I was a kid, um, what I am known for is really not what I do. I, and my life's work has had to do with thinking out how it is that we can think logically about things that don't make sense. And my book on this now has been published, and I'm, so it's, it's there for anybody who wants to work through it to see that we can actually, there are new ways to think about this and entirely new ways to investigate this question of life after death. So, Wow, I, great. And what's the title? What's the title of that book? Uh, well, in, in French, it's Donner le sens de non-sens, so making sense of nonsense. Oh, okay. Um, it's not published in the U.S., but it will be soon, hopefully, by Llewellyn. And so... Um, I don't, you know, we'll see what the title is, but there are new ways to think about this now, new ways to reformat our minds so that we can think logically about a lot of questions that didn't make logical sense beforehand. And, and I just, uh, you know, reached a point, I, um, I uh, don't know what else to say anymore, except that to my astonishment, there's life after death. You, Look at Jeff and Jeff. I mean, how do you account for that? The patient has a near-death experience and loses his leg in a horrific car crash, and the, uh, his wife is killed instantly in the crash, and the doctor talks to Jeff's deceased wife in the operating room. Well, I give up. I give right. Up. <laughs> Isn't yeah. It? What more can you say about that? I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, beyond comprehension. And I think that's the point of your, you know, talking about making sense of nonsense. I mean, it does, it does feel like nonsense. In fact, I was a former CPA and, you know, so I was very logical, linear, you know, like, and so when this happened to me, I didn't know how to, 
to frame it. I didn't have the context within my own experience to understand and really just almost brushed it off. In fact, I wrote my book, Art of Living Happy After the Loss of a Loved One. And I think I have two paragraphs about my out-of-body experience because I just didn't think it was that <laughs> remarkable, really. I mean, short of just like, wow, that was really amazing. And it changed my life, but it was beyond my my ability to really wrap my arms around how big of a deal it was. Yes, yes. I am. Uh, where I've come to on this sounds frankly psychotic and that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had uh, mixed edema, which is profound hypothyroidism. And so I've been psychotic and, um, this definitely is not psychotic. This is something that's on the other side of the reality scale than psychosis. So I, I uh, w am greatly impressed by Dr. O'Driscoll's experience and Jeff Olson's experience. Um, and, and at the same time, and as they know too, there are others like this. It's, um, Dr. O'Driscoll is very brave to come forward like this, but uh, this is something I hear from lots of doctors that uh, as the patient is dying, they most typically they say they see something leave the body at the point of death, or um, they may see apparitions of the dying patient's relatives and loved ones seem to come into the room to escort the dying person out. So. Um, at a certain point, you just, it's kind of like meteorites. Um, up until the, I guess sometime in the earlier part of 19th century, um, when people would describe meteorites falling, the scholars said, well, that's impossible because as Aristotle pointed out, this rocks, Stones can't fall from heaven because there are no stones in heaven to fall. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know whether this is apocryphal or not. I, I read this in 1969, and it's an old, old story, but it's apparently uh, in Connecticut, in, uh, or somewhere in New England, um, in the early part of the 19th century, there was a huge meteorite fall and two professors um, from Yale or Princeton, I forget which, went to the site and gathered the rocks and wrote a scientific report on it. And um, so Jefferson, being a man of science, was asked by the editors of the journal to write a comment. And his comment was, Gentlemen, I had rather believe that those two Yankee professors would lie than believe that stones fell from heaven. But now we accept it, and it's beginning to look like to me that life after death will be another one of those things that eventually does get written into the books, but it will be a major event because that will. Uh, a lot of things change if you have to have a system of reason to accommodate another dimension, then that, that triggers things all down the road. We're, that's gonna be an interesting thing to see. Yes, I agree. And I think you, you say that so well because that's what my whole thought about the scientific world is that Yes, they they prove things, quote unquote, until they're mis disproved, you know, <laughs> like the earth is flat, right? That was a big, you know, that's what we all thought or that's what, human, you know, humanity thought for a long time until, oh, no, it's round or that we, you know, the, the sun is the center of the universe, you know, I mean, no, it's not. I mean, <laughs> yes, and, and another, the way I look at that is, you know, it's, um, uh, um, we Americans especially, we leap too fast to thinking about science. Um, in reality, the question of life after death is still a philosophical question. It's because we don't really have yet scientific means that could confirm it or disconfirm it. So I think that the first 
breakthrough is not going to be scientific, but rather will be conceptual and philosophical. And I think that's happening right now. I think there's entirely new conceptual systems to integrate this um, uh, near-death experience into that will actually sort of bring it out into the open, I think. I love that. I love that. I just attended the IANS conference in Seattle and somebody said to me, this was the first time, and I think it's been going on for 20 plus years, but they said this was the first time that it feels like near-death experience is, is just a common known <laughs> accepted idea, whereas before they said at every conference, it was always like this kind of like, oh, we got to prove it. We still have to prove it, you know, or that we have to um, somehow keep, um, you know, I don't know, trying to convince people or whatever. But this, he, they said this was the first year, 2018, that it felt like, wow, you know, we've really got the scientists uh, behind us and we've got more and more doctors coming out. They were speaking at the, you know, at the event. I mean, for example, Dr. O'Driscoll, um, you know, there's, and I met several other medical personnel that I'm going to have on the podcast that, when they walk into the emergency room, she, one of them, she said, all of a sudden, a little, it's almost like a index card comes up right in front of her eyes, and it tells her what the person, what happened to them, what's going to happen to them, what kind of treatment they need, and if, you know, they're going to die or not. And so she has this information that's just readily available. So guess what? She's a fantastic ER doctor, because <laughs> she's getting help from the other side. <laughs> That's what medicine does to you in the most phenomenal way. And then eventually you reach some sort of situation where you think, well, is that my experience or is that something else? Let me, let me give you an example. Um, I did forensic psychiatry. I worked in a maximum security unit for the criminally insane. And uh, I followed the forensics for some years. It was so I, as a very minimal, I would say that I got to know 300 murderers, but that's being very conservative. It's probably more like around 400 in real, realistically. So uh, several weeks ago, you may remember that 12, I think it was, bombs were sent to American officials. Okay, so... My wife and I were standing in front of the television getting ready to leave the house when that news came on. And I said to my wife, he's in his 50s. Okay. Now that part could be experienced, but then just the weirdest thing happened. I don't know what this was, but it was over from this direction. There was, I heard like, a, like a, an electrical connection made and the words, 56 came. Well, when he was apprehended a couple of days later, he was 56. Wow. Now, I accept the 50s is just, the, well, well, what was that? 56. You right. Know? And I right. say this without full well knowing, as you know, too, that a lot of people listening to us are going to say, oh, yeah, me too. You know what? <laughs> what is that? What is that? So weird. Yes, it, it is so weird. And that's, I've done some stage shows where I bring through passed away loved ones and, and similar types of things. I mean, I, like I, I always call myself my own biggest skeptic because I'm just like, wait, how did I get that? That doesn't make sense. But I remember one um, uh, person that came up and her daughter had passed away. And I said, well, you know, I gave her some information, but the one that stood out to me was, I, I said, I see the number 14 and I drew it with my fingers, you know, I said, and they're, they're big, it's a big number 14. And she just said, oh my God, that was my daughter's soccer number on the back of her jersey, you know? And so, I mean, <laughs> what is that? I don't know. I don't know if I'm reading her mind. I don't know if it's, it's something. Weird. I don't there, know but, what it is. But right. Or are you getting the 56? I mean, where does that come from? I don't know. But I, I love the idea about radio waves, you know, and how like, like, for example, on your radio in your car, right, you can be listening to one station, but there's lots of radio waves going out there that aren't tuning in to your station at, or onto your radio at that moment. So to me, I kind of that's what I equate it to, like, there's all this information coming to us. It's just whether we can tune into it and receive that information. So 
life is so weird. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, it's the funniest thing, Lisa. I, um, I hear these so-called skeptics, uh, you know, and that's a very irritating crowd to me, not because of anything to do with near-death experiences, but because I guess one of my favorite things to do is, in life is to teach ancient Greek philosophy. And when I get to the skeptics who were at, it's one of the Hellenistic movements in uh, philosophy after Aristotle, I have to go back and I have to undo the damage that those idiots put into people's mind by, they have no notion of what a skeptic is, but they love to use that term. And that's why I'm irritated. Many of them are entertainers. You know, they don't know what a skeptic is, but they've uh, taken that uh, label and falsely use it, abuse it all the time. But um, I am a skeptic in the sense, uh, and incidentally, of all those people who call themselves skeptics, I've never found one that actually has read about Pero or the Sextus Empiricus or the early skeptics. And, um, but what the skeptical movement is, it has to do with, it's a technique for not drawing conclusions. And uh, that's really what it means. And, and um, so um, I just practiced that all my life and I never got around to thinking whether I wanted there to be an afterlife or not. Because it just, I didn't know. I, but in a few years ago, it sort of hit me, well, this is actual. And then I got to thinking about well, do I want this to be or not? I'm not so sure I do. My best friend for 30 years was a guy named Milton Friedman, not the economist. My Milton always used to like to say, there are two Milton Friedmans. One has the economic solution and the other has the economic problem. And he was one <laughs> but he was also very famous and um, like he was a, speech writer for many presidents and all, but, but um, Milton and I had this, you know, we weren't too sure that, um, Milton definitely wasn't sure whether he wanted there to be an afterlife, and I'm not so sure either, but regardless of what I want or don't want, it looks like there is. Well, and that's what, that's the funny part to me too. I always say to people that are just adamant believe believers that there isn't i said well i guess you'll find out you know <laughs> or else they won't or yeah. they won't right but it's um i've that's a whole a lot of different people say that they definitely don't think it is i over the years i've always asked when somebody says to me oh there definitely is not an afterlife i want to know what their reasoning process is like out of the canada and there's different answers um some of them irrational some people say oh when i was a kid i was ter terrified by religion i just that scared me to death and now i'm out of religion you know there is no life after death well it doesn't follow from the fact that somebody was tormented by religion when they were a kid that therefore there is not a life after death. So that kind of answer is in itself irrational. Right. But, um, over the years, the people I've asked when they say positively there's not, a small group of them have the right answer. And what they say is, what are you talking about life after death anyway? What does that mean? And that's the real difficulty, see, when you, when you hear somebody talking like that, now that's your skeptic. And that, that you know, that they don't know how to draw a, a conclusion about it because the notion itself doesn't make any sense. But, and, and that's the reality of it. But, as we've been in that situation many times before, you're obviously a well-educated and informed person of the year 2018 go back in your mind to the year 20, or go back in your mind to the year 1918, okay? And be a well-educated, informed person at that period and listen to the following sentences. All four of Ethel's grandparents 
perished and were lost in a shipwreck long before her mother and father were born. In 1918, that's nonsense, right? Right. right. But nowadays, we can think of the, the probes underneath, the, the DNA, the gene editing, the cloning, and it's a conceivable scenario. Or again, go back to 1918 and listen to these words. Two women got married in, to each other in, at City Hall yesterday. In 1918, nonsense. Today, it's the law of the land. Or listen to this, 1918. I watched a movie on my phone this morning. <laughs> and nonsense in 1918, but a daily experience in 2018. So just because something is unintelligible nonsense doesn't mean that it won't eventually be uh, accepted as a reality. That's right. I love that. I love that. Well, it's talking about who knows, um, you know, reality or not i'd love to pull a few cards for you and see what um mm -hmm. see what they say does that sound good mm -hmm. okay my daughter has been doing something with that lately. oh great okay so i pull three cards and the first card is usually the blockage card and so let me just pull them up here so i can see so um so the, the card that I pulled is light. And what I'm getting about that for you, it's not so much um, a blockage card as much as there is just, there's so much light coming through you. I mean, it's just like, it's just been happening ever since you, I want to say stumbled across all of this near death experience um, stuff. <laughs> Cause like you said, I don't think this was necessarily the path that you thought you were going on. Is that correct? That's correct. So you've just kind of, you know, continued to, to go down that road because it just, life kind of led you that way. And so the second card is freedom, which is what I think it, it really allowed you to have freedom throughout your life. You know, this whole. Not so much. No? No. Well, no. tell me about that. Contrary. I often think if I had it to do over and if I, if I knew when I wrote that in 1974 that it would lead to the specific things in my life to me I wouldn't have published it I really it because that's my process but publishing it no to choose this no the things that have come to me because of that are not so good wow wow but, that's really you know, interesting I don't, know, I don't know what I would do if I went back and they said, well, it does these things to you, but at other people, if they added other people, it helps, that would be a tough decision. But I know, it, you know, it's just the one axis, I would not have done it. No. Wow. That's really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Moody, because I know so many people have gotten so much from that book and it really opened i mean it opened really the world to to the idea of of the afterlife and and near death so interesting that you say that uh well the outcome card was communication which i think that is what it what it did do you know is i think it opened up um communication about about near-death experience and um and and yeah, like you said, whether it was uh, your choosing or if you had chosen to, you know, not do that, maybe el maybe somebody else would have brought it forward. But um, it's really, really interesting. I'm just curious. So you don't know what you would have rather have done? Yes, I would have been much happier, I think, just as a professor of logic and philosophy of language. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, it'll be interesting to see, not that we'll be able to see it, but maybe you will when you, um, you know, cross over and, and have that life review and <laughs> maybe you'll find out yeah, more about why and that. why it all unfolded that way. Looking forward to that and um, feel it's not too much longer. I'm 74. My parents died when I was 70. They were 72. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting on out of here. My, my kids are grown now and 20 and 18. And what horrifies me is the idea of being stuck. I, uh, you know, I was, uh, I did some forensic psychiatry before I went to 
and I mean some geriatric psychiatry before I went into the forensic part and um, I just saw that happen all the time where elderly people even if they may make their choices clear and written then they are taken up into this system and wires and tubes I'm I've for several years now I've been in my mind to definitely you know I don't want to go that route because I'm my kids you know it's I can't putting my my young children through that just to hold on for a, a number of months or years in a nursing home that's not my style so right. I want to get out of here while I can still move around and take a walk every day. I love that. I love that. I've, I've recently started volunteering for hospice. And so I, I totally understand what you mean. And, and um, I think that's another whole question that's, that's coming up. In fact, Hawaii just recently passed their uh, more or less right to die, um, yeah. uh, you know, legislature so that people can, can make that choice. And yet there are so many, <laughs> there are so many, I guess requirements. Fundamentalists. Right. Hold it back. That's right, it. right. But they also have so many requirements within the law that it's almost impossible for you to to carry it out. I mean, there's there's about twenty different steps that have to that have Well, to as you know from your hospice work, there is the articulated information and there's the information that is underneath the surface. And I'm just very grateful, you know, and when it was came to my mom that the nurses, you know, I mean, there are things that you just don't say, but that you do. And um, we were just so relieved when the nurses came in that day and just gave my mother the relief. So, um, you know, and that's the practice, but if you talk about this, why, uh, Pat Robertson would have to have a special on the 700 clones. <laughs> Round us all up and put us in his Jesus jail, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But, so what do you think, is there one, I don't know, is there something you'd like to share that's kind of your overall philosophy about life? Or, I mean, I love that you're a, you know, philosophy professor and, um, you know, just... Well, you know, I, um, I don't have any, I am a philosopher, philosophy professor, but I, uh, I don't really have any big grand advice about the life. I, I guess where I've come to realize is uh, in my own process is what this thing we're in is the movies, right? And uh, it's different from the ones you go down, go to at the mall because uh, in the movies that you and I are in, we are embedded in the character rather than seeing the character on a screen. I, uh, I like what Ellie v Wiesel said, God made man because he loves stories. And what is your life but your story, right? That's your personal identity, is your narrative. And um, where I'm beginning to see is that um, this is a play and that what the, where the theater came from is this very tendency of human beings. I used to hear my geriatric patients say all the time, the ones who were cognitively sharp, who would say, um, when you get to a certain age, the more the impression develops when you look back at your life that it, it's been a play. And um, I think Ellie Wiesel was right. God made man because he loves stories. We're story beasts. What is, <laughs> we're a story, right? Each person is a story. And um, I like, uh, Meister Eckhart said, the eyes with which I see God are the same eyes with which God sees me. I think that's how it works. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And tell me, what are you up to these days? You've got a, a new uh, a, a university or, or what's happening with yes, you? This is called the University of Heaven.com. You can reach us at www.theuniversityofheaven.com. And we're doing uh, webinars and programs and lectures and courses 
And uh, so we're having a great deal of fun with this. Hope people will join in. We, we like many others in our generation, are um, not the most uh, uh, vibrantly wealthy people in the world. So we are, we are uh, have our prices for those who are in our same situation. So we're just uh, the University of Heaven is dot com is. Um, you know, we're just doing some great programs. So check us out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Moody. This has been such a, such a gift for me to be able to connect with you. And, and uh, I just, I love what you've done and, um, and just what a bright shining light you are. Thank you. Thank you. You too. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Exploring Death podcast. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Before you make any financial or legal decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Exploring Death. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.